Today I'm going to review the consciousness instinct. Unraveling the Mystery of How the Brain Makes the Mind by Michael S. Gazaniga. This book, it's a little bit different than the last book I reviewed on consciousness, which was Consciousness and the Brain. Consciousness and the Brain was really based on research and, you know, all, all the physical realities of what's going on in the brain, like the, the materials and how they interact and how they send signals, things like that. Uh, consciousness, or the consciousness instinct, it's kind of a mix of philosophy of mind, uh, the history of thinking behind consciousness, and then uh, there's a little bit of like modern research um, at the end of the book. Uh, the book's kind of short. It's only about 230-something pages. And so to kind of to cover all three of those topics... I felt like the author didn't really have enough time to go in depth enough on the interesting stuff, and other parts of the book were a little long winded. The book starts off, uh, really, the first third of the book. It's all about the history of science and all the the thinking that that led up to consciousness and how we thought about consciousness. And this it lasted way too long, in my opinion. That intro. It's kind of boring and repetitive. It's information I've heard a lot before. I don't really think it added much to the book at all. Uh, and really, my first impression of this book, especially coming from the consciousness instinct, which was very straightforward to the point and just packed with uh, bits and pieces of research and conclusions uh, and information, really, it felt like the consciousness instinct was... It's, it'd almost be like sitting on the porch on like a Sunday afternoon talking to like an old person and how that old person would tell you a story. You know, they're kind of, it's going to kind of be long winded. They might meander a little bit, but in the end, they might hit a couple interesting points. And that's kind of how this book was. Uh, the first third was too slow and long winded. And then a lot of the points didn't tie into the conclusion. But in the end, there was some interesting stuff in the book. So the middle part of the book is, uh, it's better than the first part of the book. It's In the second part of the book, the author's going into the the architecture of the mind and how he thinks it's, it's modular and how consciousness kind of rises up depending on how many modules you have. Uh, and he uses a lot of information about people that have uh, injured brains to kind of show you how people remain conscious, but certain things will be removed from their consciousness depending on uh, what parts of their brain are working. And you kind of use that as a way to guess at how consciousness would be for other types of animals, other uh, beings that have different types of minds. And that was an interesting part. It was only like 80 pages. Uh, so there's statements he made and, and thoughts he had. And I don't know whether to believe what he says or not because... When he says something that sounds controversial, he doesn't spend enough time backing that point up. So it's hard to really jump on board with him because you're kind of left to depend on his authority because he's not giving you his reasons all the time. So it's like, do I trust this guy and believe this? Or, you know, do I think this is kind of sketchy? This is uh, iffy knowledge. And maybe, uh, you know, I'll continue to believe what I believe. And there's a few times like that in the book where I wish he would have spent more time really making his case. There's one part uh, near the end of the book where he's talking about split brains and, and how both hemispheres of the brain remain conscious. But, I mean, to my knowledge, I think only one side of the brain uh, can, like, speak. And, and one the person only experiences one, but there's evidence that the other hemisphere might have a lot of elements of consciousness. But it... It's like, who's experiencing that? Um, I don't know, it's kind of a weird topic. And he didn't really provide enough information to really be clear on that. And I read that, and it startled me, and I was waiting for him to explain, and he never did. So even at the end of the book, I'm not sure whether or not that's a true statement or not, if both lobes of the brain would be conscious if you if you cut them off. Because, I mean, I, I just didn't hear enough argument to believe that, but it might be true. There might be a good argument out there. I just might not know it. 
And so that's kind of uh, something that I didn't like about the book was that parts of it were too long, then other parts were, were way too short. And really the last part of the book was, was really short. That's where he gets into some really abstract things. And his grand conclusion is that he thinks consciousness uh, is really derived from the complementarity of you know the process of the brain. And that's really just talking about or complementarity. It's there's there's two ways to describe some things, uh, and this comes out of quantum physics, I believe. Uh, there's there's two ways of describing something, and both are accurate, but you can never derive one explanation from the other explanation. And in and, and in quantum theory, uh, this has to do with like the particle view of quantum mechanics, and then like the wave function of quantum mechanics, and how they both explain some things, but you can never tell how the wave would behave by treating, you know, quantum th- objects as particles. Like, though they both explain some things, but neither one explains everything. And you think something like that's going on with consciousness, though he doesn't make the case good enough for me. I mean, it's interesting to think about, and I liked his, his view, his ideas at least, but it wasn't long enough to really get a good understanding of it. And even now, I'm not sure I'm doing his opinion justice because that last section, he talks about quantum theory, uh, split brain research, and his view of complementarity. And it, it's all in like 80 pages. And 80 pages is just not nearly enough to cover all that material, uh, especially if you compare it to a book like I Am a Strange Loop by Douglas Hofstadter. He spends so long building up a pretty mild point in that book, whereas this book is very short and he just races through some material. So I'm not sure how to to view his opinion. There's some interesting ideas here, but overall, I don't think this was the best written book. Um, If I was going to recommend a book on consciousness, this wouldn't be the first book that I recommended. I, I would kind of exhaust some other books. Consciousness in the Brain would probably be the first one that I'd recommend, but this one uh, later on. But it was okay. Uh, One thing, the author does make a very firm statement on whether he believes machines can be conscious, and he doesn't think that uh, silicon chips or computers as they exist today could ever be conscious. He thinks that complementarity that arrives out of, of real physical systems and quantum objects interacting that there's no there's no way to to abstract uh, the processes of the brain away and then replicate it in silicon and have that object uh, be conscious so he was very firm on that which is nice but again he didn't give enough information to really back any of these ideas up they seem more like you know initial thoughts instead of you know something that should go into a book and really be a complete uh, talk or a complete um, set of ideas around that core theme or that core thesis. So it was kind of disappointing in some regards, but it was interesting. The author is like 79 years old. Um, I'm not sure when this book came out. Let me look. I think it's pretty recent, or it's not It's not too old. It's only a few years old. Oh, copyright 2018. So the book is recent, so the author was probably 78 or something like that. So I think that had to do with how he wrote the book. Not that there's anything against people that are 78 years old, but I think people write differently at that age. And my initial impressions uh, where I was talking about, it's like listening to an old person on a porch just kind of talk. I didn't know how old the author was when I first came up with that analogy. That was one of the first comments I made. I made a note on my phone when I first started reading this book. I had no idea how old the author was, and it turns out he's exactly how old I thought he was or my initial impressions, he's exactly how old my initial impressions uh, of him were. So I really think that is an aspect of this book you should think about, which means it's an interesting read. It's kind of an interesting read, but it's not direct and to the point, and it's not going to be as jam-packed with information as another book. So if that's what you're interested in, you know, you could go pick it up and, and or get the audiobook and listen to it. There's some interesting thoughts, but... Overall, I don't think it was the best book on the topic. Um, It's kind of disappointing because there's some interesting stuff on there, and I think if he would have focused on that and really expanded the interesting points into a book, he really could have made a great book that that I would have really strongly recommended. But as it is, I don't think it's complete, and so 
you know, read some other books first. Uh, and if you're still interested, then go ahead and take a look at The Consciousness Instinct. So I hope you guys like this video. I've got more books, more book reviews coming soon. I got some more books on consciousness. Another one that'll be coming real soon. And then I think I might, I'm going to review The Gene by Siddhartha Mukherjee. And then uh, maybe a book on cognitive biases, uh, maybe predictably irrational or something like that. So if that sounds interesting, so sorry. So if that sounds interesting to you, uh, subscribe and stick around. And I hope to see you guys in the next one.